What, what, when were you born? When? Yeah. 1922. I've lived here all my life, every yeah. day. Uh, except for service time, I've been here all the time. December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. At that time, I was working at uh, Bell Aircraft in Buffalo. When I first heard about it, it was when I came home from work. It was, of course, all over the radio. You didn't, didn't have television, it was radios. And that's all there was on the radio was, was December 7th. I don't know as I worried much about it at that time. Yeah. Uh, there had been uh, the draft, of course, before that started, uh, just barely started. And uh, a couple of guys from Little Drive went in real early. One lived right across the street from me there, Neil Flint, was one of the first numbers called. So I didn't quit until the uh, first part of August in 1943, actually. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, did, did you enlist, or did, did well, you was, ultimately drafted, get a letter? Drafted, drafted yeah. Got drafted. Got a notice from the draft board. Draft board was in Salamanca. Okay. It's a Camp Upton. And uh, the thing I remember the most down there was probably 300 young guys all my same age. And uh, you're on one end of a big, big long building. Uh, after an hour or so, or two, whatever, about an hour probably, you came out this end of that same building. On this end, it was, it was 300 different looking people. On this end, was 300 that all looked exactly alike, <laughs> in uniform, <laughs> with a brand new haircut. Yeah. Yeah. All of you had a, a little bit of round left up here. <laughs> Four days later, there was a shipment of us went out to uh, uh, BTC-10 in Greensboro, North Carolina. That's Basic Training Center, 10, in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is all Air Force. Uh, the rest of it was, it was all with machine guns, with 50 caliber machine guns, and you learned how to use those things. And uh, eventually you got to fly with them. Uh, you got really got hardened into the service at, at, in uh, on gunnery school. Well, we got out of there, we were the 44th class to, gradu fourth class to graduate in 1944. 44-4 we were. I, I flew in the 2nd Division, which was all B-24s. Uh, the other two divisions were 17s. And they flew a whole lot of missions out of England. The casualty rate among combat crews was about 44%, uh, which with our crew about somewhere near, because before my crew died. And uh, I was one of the lucky ones. So you figure that there are six survivors for each plane gets shot down. There probably were 20,000 GIs from the Air Force that had been shot down. How many B-24s, B-27s, or B-26s, B-17s were shot down over in Europe? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. They had one of the best aircraft systems in the world, and, uh, and one of the best rifles in the world. Uh, if you talk to any uh, veteran from Europe, all you got to say is 88. The 88. He knows exactly what you mean. 88 millimeters is the uh, diameter size of a shell. Uh, the 75 is about three inches. Of course, and you get, you, uh, so this is four inches or so in diameter, the shell itself. Uh, the 88 was nasty, and uh, they knew how to use them. Uh, this country had 90 millimeter, which was just a hair bigger, but the 88 was a better rifle. Yes, it was on a Sunday morning, beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, hot, and the sky was blue, and not a cloud in the sky, the sun was shining bright. So the airplane showed up real good at 18,000 feet, which was low. Uh, normally you flew 21 to 22,000 feet. And, uh, it was on a Sunday morning, beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, hot, and the sky was blue, and not a cloud in the sky, the sun was shining bright. So the airplane showed up real good at 18,000 feet, which was low. Uh, normally you flew 21 to 22,000 feet. Fillet's pocket, they called it. Now you've heard about that too. Started on con at one end, fillet's on the other, maybe 20 to 25 miles or so from end to end. The idea was, they had two bridges across this river. They were, they're big enough to hold these big German tanks that weighed 65, 70 tons. Don't bomb the bridge. Do the approaches. We, had, we, had, we were loaded with 57 100-pound bombs. We want to use that bridge. And uh, do the approaches. Just slow them down. And uh, 
So because the woods were full of this stuff, they had it hidden all over the place, the Jerry's did, because the only time they could move was at night. And anyway, uh, that's why we were flying at 18,000 instead of 21 or 22. Mm -hmm. It was more accurate. And we just barely got the IP, the initial point, where the, the, the bombardier takes over flying the airplane through the uh, Norden bomb site. And he controls the altitude and the speed and the whole shebang. And uh, when he sees the, t the target there, he sees I IP as initial point, is a, is a landmark, a very, very visible landmark. Sticks out like a, you know, sore thumb. And uh, so he, from the time he hits that point, it's, it's straight and level everything to the target. So that everything is constant. And bombs are supposed to hit the target. Well, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. So just about the time we hit the IP, we also got hit. And uh, the 88 hit right between number one and number two engines on a B-24, which is not good. And uh, uh, of course, there's six, 700 gallons of 100 octane gas still right there in that wing, right there. And of course, that was on fire real quick. But the worst damage, of course, was the damage to the structure of the wing. And uh, uh, blew about two thirds of the, everything that held together, about two thirds of it off or more, all of a sudden, bang. Uh, and the rest of it lasted, I would say, 20, 20 to 25 seconds before the rest of that wing came off. Now then, uh, B-24 doesn't fly good on one wing. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, when that bomb, when that 88 went off, I was within the length of that room in there from it. And when it went off, it gets your attention right off quick. And uh, what's, what's the <laughs> sensation? <laughs> what, what, what do you what do you hear feel? What's the well, anyway? As I remember, I was looking out the waste window, and uh, at the other uh, rest of formation, then the ground, of course, and looking for fighters. Anyway, okay, uh, you're you're the machine yeah, gunner. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, there's a great big flash and a big noise. And as I say, the length of that room from where I was standing, and uh, a great big orange flash, and and instantly fire going from, for, from that wing clear back past the tail. Of course, you're doing, what, 175 miles an hour. And uh, uh, I didn't see the damage to the wing, but I knew there was a whole lot of damage there. It must be somewhere because of all that fire. And then the bailout bell started to ring. Now, that's like a doorbell, except you can hear it from here halfway to Jamestown. And uh, it's loud. I'll tell you, you can't miss it. It's loud. Uh, my flash helmet, had flown off. Some what the hell happened there? I, for, later, I thought I got a head right up here. <laughs> it took my frack helmet off. Anyway, uh, so uh, that bailout began, began to ring, and uh, uh, you have a helmet on, leather helmet. Uh, you have uh, uh, oxygen mask fastened to it, and you have a throat mic fastened to it, and uh, I just did like this. Everything came off to once, and. Uh, uh, my helmet with my parachute set right in the exact same spot that every time I got on the airplane, that's the spot I sit in. Right there, always, always the same spot. I grabbed it, snapped it on my harness, and the escape hatch in at 17 back there is in the floor. And op opening makes opening maybe this wide and this long. Yeah. And uh, so it has a, a D handle down here that uh, you walk on this thing all the time and uh, grabbed that D-handle and snapped it up over here against the wall over here. Here's a hole in the floor. And I said, and Marty Lavner, the other waist gunner, and Joe Larusco, the tail gunner, were right beside me, ready to go. I said, goodbye, fellas, and out I went, head first. Marty said, I almost kicked him in the face when he went out. His face was right behind my feet going out that hole. Joe never made it. There's, with only one wing, it tips up this way. Now the hole in the floor is now a hole in the ceiling, oh, no. more or less, see? That's why four of them didn't get out. They didn't have time. And, and uh, as I say, from the beginning, from the time of that explosion until the time I left, I don't think it was over 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe it was a few, but darn few. And uh, so, so then down I come in a 24-foot parachute. Nice, great, big, white parachute, you know. And uh, which was the first time for me, of course. Uh, and the thing you notice, the first thing you notice is how quiet it is. Just really quiet, I'll tell you. That's the first thing you notice. And then you look down in the ground. You're not getting down closer to the ground. The ground is getting closer to you up here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, I get down fairly close to the ground and I'm going, I'm drifting backwards, which is a no-no. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, but there's some woods over here. 
I could see. I, that's where I wanted to get. I didn't want to come down here. And if I was drifting backwards, I didn't much care. I wanted to get over here. But I never made it. And uh, I got within maybe 300 feet of the ground. There was, I could see four jury soldiers down here. And uh, uh, one of them was kind of the, had a little bit of, of uh, rank, apparently. He was one in charge of the, the, the group. Because um, all of a sudden, one of them raised his rifle up and let one off. You know, I could see the, I could see the rifle come up and a little bit of puff of smoke out of the muzzle. And at the same time you see that, you hear the bullet when it went by. Uh, it's not good news. Uh, but he never fired again. The, the, the guy that had a little rifle just reached over and pushed his muzzle down like this. Well, anyway, I got to the ground all in one piece. This one guy that had little authority said uh, he couldn't speak English very well. But uh, what he said was, Vor. Instead of uh, uh, for, it was a vor with a V. Vor you. Der vor, vor is over. Over. Mm. And that's the, all, of, all, all, he, all it was said. And I didn't say a word. How did you feel? I mean, you're. you're, uh, now you're I was captured. mad. I was mad. I, I, I wasn't going back to England, <laughs> which I knew, of course, and I, I didn't like the idea of being, being over here to being a PW. So I took my boots off, put my shoes on, which I had taken with me, had it wired to my parachute harness. And the four Jerry's, we went to about oh, 500 yards or maybe uh, to a uh, French house in this edge of this little village with Lalande Saint Simeon. So these other four guys from our crew came in, all, they made six of us all together. He had a, his parachute. Uh, so the French Red Cross gals, they were feeding us, and we gave him that parachute, one of them. And, uh, uh, and they made uh, six, 12 handkerchiefs. 12 pieces just like that, and six scars. They cut panels out and, and you know, came them up. The scars were probably this long and this wide. Well, the Germans took the scars away from it, because you could wrap them around a the guy's neck, you know, pull them pretty tight. And so they took, but we kept the handkerchiefs, of course. And they managed to get one of them home. Uh, in Orbeck, and finally we were there, I don't know, maybe five days all together. And, uh, the, but the Canadians were getting pretty darn close. So I say, they, they got to Orbeck just two or three days after we left. So they left Orbeck in this truck, approximately 25 of us. In the back of this truck, the jury guard in each corner with a burp, what they call a burp gun, like it. And we hadn't gone very far before we caught up to a, a group of trucks on this black top road. And uh, uh, all Red Cross trucks heading in the wrong direction. They weren't heading, they were heading towards the front lines, not to the rear. And uh, that means there's no wounded on there. They're going the other way. And uh, well, no, just a couple of minutes here come four uh, P-47 fighter planes. They had just taken off. They were fully armed. Each one carried a 500-pound bomb underneath the wheels, you know, underneath. And oh boy, here's this, this, this convoy. Shoot them up. And, uh, and there's a couple of, of English Spitfire pilots also. And they wanted to get in on the action too. Well, anyway, we, so we could watch those guys peeling off. The jury guards jumped, the truck stopped, and uh, the jury guards jumped off in the ditch, all four of them. We had to stay up here, but we each had these scars, these handkerchiefs, and at that time we had the scars. And uh, we're waving those things for all we're worth, I'll tell you. You look right up here, and here's eight barrels of machine guns pointing right at you. <laughs> you. You kind of wonder sometimes, but they didn't pull a trigger. And uh, one P-47 drops a bomb behind us in a road. So they can't back up and get out of the way. But he missed the road by quite a ways. And I, and I thought I was going to swallow that sucker. And uh, I could see it coming down. Anyway, so uh, the truck driver was, an old, was a German kid. He'd been all shot up. And he couldn't do much else except drive a truck. And we kept being it on the top of the hood. And we finally got the jury guards in the truck. And we turned around and got the hell out of there. And uh, they shot the rest of the convoy up. And it was full of machine gun ammunition. Some of them, we could hear it popping away. <laughs> and uh, anyway, because uh, Herman Horn, uh, Goring there had been told, doesn't mean you wish they got red crosses. They're loaded with ammunition, they're going to get shot. And they sure did. And we saw hundreds of bodies uh, of German infantry that were just outside the road. Brrr, that's, it was the end of them, too. And they used horses. Germans used a lot of horses uh, because they didn't have much, uh, uh, had vehicles enough. And uh, a lot of dead horses. And then it was hot. Oh, my, it was hot in the uh, devil. And, uh, Horses were all blowed up like this, ready to explode. Oh, it stunk like the devil. Uh, one uh, German on a motorcycle, got, he got it too. Uh, his motorcycle was there and he was still there. His motorcycle was still burning. And uh, it was gruesome, a lot of it. And then they put us on a train. And uh, 
And the French box cars, you know, the French box cars had single trucks on each end. Uh, they're about on the inside, approximately seven feet wide, and I don't know just how long, not very long, and you've heard the expression, 40, 40 men and eight horses. Well, okay, 40 men would be a lot of them. There were 60. The Germans counted 60 POWs in each one of the little French box cars. You were crammed in there a little bit tighter than sardines. They had cut two holes in the, in the car, one this end, one that end, oh, maybe so square. They nailed barbed wire, a real a lot of barbed wire, on the outside of the car, over the top of those holes, so you couldn't climb out. And we had a 10-quart metal bucket. That was our facility. And you were, you were shut in there and locked in there, not only today, but tonight, tomorrow, and the next day, for three or four days to a time. Uh, and we got to Amiens, or Amiens, whatever they call it. It took two or three days or four. Uh, Amiens is a big French town. and. Uh, uh, we were there in the yards for two or three couple of days, I guess, right in the same damn cars. But they did let us out once, uh, from there to Berlin. So we ran that stupid boxcar, I don't know, for eight or nine days. No food, no water, no nothing. And uh, got to, the little uh, railroad village there for that place was uh, Kifidy, uh, K-I-F-I-E-D-Y or something like that, as it said in the station. And it, oh, a mile and a half from there to to the uh, actually the compound where we stayed, Route Four. Uh, so I rode out through the uh, pine trees, and uh, I don't know how many of us there was, two or three hundred, I guess. And uh, uh, German guards, uh, they had canine dogs, several of those. Uh, the command German uh, guard command commander of the guard was was a little short guy. And uh, he rode in a buggy, and he had a driver driving a oh, beautiful horse, and he was dressed up, but I'm telling you, 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 you could use his boots for a mirror. And, uh, uh, but he hated the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force had burned up the city of Hamburg and killed his wife and kids. Mm. And he didn't like Air Force personnel at all, which included most of them. But I had diphtheria. Now, uh, it, uh, first thing you know, you, you, you get pretty warm, and your throat feels funny. Uh, actually, your throat swells up, and uh, uh, you get quite warm too. My temperature was around 104. When the American, we had one American doctor and two English doctors there, and uh, what what they called a hospital was just another barracks, but not with where you lived. It was outside the camp, outside the wall, so to speak. So I was there in that what in that room with all these dip patients, uh, eight or ten days. Did they treat you okay? Not bad. Uh, we stayed in the, in the barracks there, and uh, uh, in Luft 4, we stayed, we, we had sports equipment, uh, no balls, but they had footballs, and uh, they put on a play at Christmas time and invited the jury commander, and he came in, and uh, uh, and Silent Night was the last one, of course. Uh, anyway, uh, no, we, we, we mind ourselves, we behaved ourselves, and never got any trouble that I know of uh, in at least in our compound. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody ever. Uh, Eisenhower had broadcast over BBC, which we had access to, incidentally, and uh, uh, the Germans tried to find the radios, never did. Uh, they, you know, we had to plug into the German electrical current to make the radios work. Not me. The radio and the radio operators, a couple of them, they, they, when they created with them, uh, parts of these radios and uh, to put it back together again. And somehow, I don't know just how it was done. Anyway, so we had, they'd plug in a, a, a BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, about twice a week for maybe five minutes or so at news time. And then they shut them out quick because the juries could trace them through the electrical system. Oh, sure. And uh, the juries tried to find them, they knew it, and they, but they never found them as far as I know. And they also carried them out of Roof 4 these guys, a couple of these guys, and took them into Luft 1. You know, a little later, of course, we never, our search into Luft 1 didn't amount to much. And, uh, but anyway... Uh, Were there uh, any, any escape attempts? Not that I know of. Yeah. Not that I know of. Bisenhower had broadcast that uh, you guys stay where you are, they so will get to you before you, you could get to us. Right. That was on the BBC and mm -hmm. when it was in Luft 4 that winter, and uh, which I believe was probably the best thing to do is stay where you were. You, you were still alive, you, you weren't uh, eating very good, uh, 
They say. I, I... So the, the guy in our room, uh, his name was Bob Conley. He had lived in Brooklyn, worked in the Brooklyn Naval Yards, and we got talking to this Jerry Guard, and he came from Brooklyn. He'd been here, he worked in Brooklyn. Yeah, so Bob started asking him questions and talk. Before they got through, they were old, old buddies. This German guard had worked in the Brooklyn Naval Yards and lived on this certain street and number in Brooklyn. And the two of them together knew every damn bartender there was in the city of Brooklyn. Okay, <laughs> that's my word. <laughs> and this Jerry says, how soon can I get back to the States after this stupid war, he says. <laughs> and, uh, and they all felt that way. They, all these old Germans were, were uh, the guards, a lot of them were older, and the Nazi party was uh, the younger bunch. And uh, uh, people, anybody 40 years or older, on that get war to get over just as fast as they could. They didn't want any part of it. We stayed there three, four, five more days, and uh, finally they put us on a train and, and sent us to Luft One. Uh, we stayed there in Luft One, and uh, uh, Hitler had sent word up through the, up to our command, uh, the commander of the place, the German commander, that no Allied airmen was to be repatriated alive. Mm. You know what that means, huh? Mm. And uh, anyway. So on the, actually the 30th day of April, a tin can came over the fence, a coffee can out of Red Cross parcel, and there was a note in it. And a guy hollered as he threw it over from this compound. It's quite a long ways, too, and over to where I was on this side. They take this up to the CO, and uh, so I, I didn't open it, of course. I just went up to it. Hey, here's this can came, just came over the fence. Well, it wasn't the first one. And uh, the Jerry's had left the camp command that uh, four compound, American compound commanders, know that they were leaving that night, but they weren't to advertise it. <laughs> you know, you didn't let them know until 7 or 8 o'clock, and, uh, and they left shortly after dark, apparently, because when we got up on my birthday, first day of May, no Germans in sight, nobody in the towers. There's, there's 10,000 GIs and uh, running all over the place. Someone just took off and left. Uh, a lot of them didn't. Uh, the village of Barth was oh, a couple of miles down the road from camp, a lot of guys went down and run around Barth, and there was a print in a printing place there, made a newspaper place. But apparently, some GIs, POWs, had worked in it's a printing business. And they put this piece of paper together, and and uh, everybody got they printed them by the millions, apparently, because everybody got it. And uh, that's actually a copy of the original, and the original was put away somewhere. And uh, so, tell us all about finding the Russians. And got him into camp, and they made it, finally made arrangements to evacuate that camp and to fly everybody back to France. And they did. There was an airfield at Barth, and they flew in 10 B 17s to a time. And they, they had sealed off their bomb bay doors. They could each haul 100, or each haul 30, I'm quite sure it was 30 POWs. And, uh, and all they came was a, just a, a, a uh, you know, just a, just a pilot and cold pilot and a navigator, more or less, and radio operators, other than no crew members of any kind. Anyway, so uh, all these PWs had to line up along the runway, or the taxiway along the edge, and uh, uh, you were part of one number. There were stakes out there driven in the ground with numbers on, number 13, 14, 15. Behind each stake was 30 POWs, <laughs> and they stayed there too. <laughs> And uh, 17 landed, taxied around, and when they stopped, each one stopped right by one of those stakes. Talk about discipline. Yeah. And uh, 30 GIs went out each one to hurry. They weren't on the ground more than 10 minutes. Then away they went again. We flew back to uh, not far from uh, La Harve, to, uh, just outside Camp Lucky Strike. Well, there was only two or three Russians that showed up. Oh, really? That's all. There was a Russian commander, officer, and he was only there one day, I guess, and he made a little noise. But mostly he was left to his, his subordinates and the, and the camp commanders and from, uh, from our, our POW outfit to make all the arrangements. But anyway, we, we landed just, just a little ways out from, out from uh, uh, La Harve there, apparently, Camp Lucky Strike. And we were there. We finally had a chance to get cleaned up. And uh, I'm telling you, we were an awful mess. And uh, uh, we got our train tickets home on the Erie Railroad from Jersey City to Salamanca, and got to Salamanca on a Sunday. And uh, uh, I had sent a telegram, you couldn't get next to a telephone, 
and uh, that morning, and uh, they were crashed. There were lines 20 feet long, every telephone in town. Anyway, so I sent a telegram to my parents. I'd be in Salamanca somewhere around 6.30 p.m. that day, and uh, they never got it till after I got home that night. Well, then uh, a guy named Francis Chaplin had come down from the pond. He had a camp up there, too, and he had me coming down the street when I was walking across the street. And so he called up there to Dick Miro's place. Dick had a telephone up there to tell my parents that I was home. And down they come. <laughs> you finally catch up with your parents. Yeah. You hadn't seen in a while. What was that like? <laughs> what kind of teary, <laughs> kind of teary, probably <laughs> not only me, but uh, parents, friends, relatives. <laughs> yeah, we got there probably 7 o'clock or so, by 7.30 or 8 o'clock. We had a lot of people there. <laughs> yeah, pretty teary I was. Anyway, I get this way once in a while. Uh, like the, like the first trip we went back, uh, I told him I wasn't coming back. I wanted to forget. I don't have a lot of years left. That's why I, that's why I bought a car. <laughs> <laughs>